Last week I talked a bit about the drug war, and I said that the rule of law has been destroyed by the drug war and by similar laws against what we call victimless crimes, crimes in which there is no victim coming into court and testifying and saying, I have been assaulted, my property has been stolen, I have been hurt by this person, but instead these are crimes against the state. And I also said that once you go down that road where you have no victim to testify, you then get into completely uncharted territory and it becomes inevitable that you have things like police lying, posing as drug dealers, you have sting operations trying to capture capture people that way since there are no victims to report the crimes, and you have situations in which uh, you have to rely on criminals to testify against other criminals. Almost always in a drug case, when somebody testifies against the defendant, the person testifying has already either been charged or convicted with a drug crime, and he is there in court trying to get a more lenient sentence for himself by testifying against someone else. And this not only leads to all kinds of underlings getting sentences that should go to the so-called kingpins against whom all these laws are directed, but in many cases they are innocent people who are charged and convicted of crimes simply on the basis of testimony from criminals, from people who are known to be criminals and are known to the prosecutors as criminals. Let me give you a couple of examples. In 1997, a woman named Susan Penkowitz uh, told her friend Jenny that she would ride down to Tijuana and help her retrieve her car. I don't know why the car was down there, but the two of them rode back from Tijuana. They hit the border, and there were the drug enforcement agents, and they wanted to search Jenny's car. They did, and they found 43 pounds of heroin hidden inside the gas tank. Jenny immediately confessed to being a drug smog smuggler, and she told the authorities that Suzanne had not only nothing to do with this, but hadn't even known that there was heroin in the car. But after several hours of intimidation, Jenny changed her story and implicated Suzanne in order to obtain leniency for herself. For her cooperation, Jenny, who was the actual drug smuggler, got off with a six-month sentence at a minimum security prison. Suzanne, who was completely innocent of the crime, was sentenced to six and a half years in federal prison. Suzanne couldn't cooperate because there was nothing that she had to offer. She could not put the finger on somebody else because she didn't know anything about the drug business. Suzanne had no criminal record of any kind, and both the judge and the prosecuting attorney acknowledged that Suzanne didn't know there was heroin in the car. But still, she was convicted and sentenced as a conspirator, and she received a sentence that was ten times as long as the sentence given to the actual drug smuggler. Now, this is not unusual, and it is not unusual because it is inevitable that this sort of thing is going to happen. They have to have the mandatory minimum sentences because they have to have a club with which to hit anybody charged with a drug crime. They have to be able to say, we're going to give you 20 years if you don't cooperate and turn in a whole bunch of other people. And, of course, if they turn in a whole bunch of other people, you're dealing with somebody who's a criminal, and you have no way of knowing whether he's telling you the truth about these other people. But by taking the word of this uh, acknowledged criminal, the prosecuting attorney gets the opportunity to convict five or ten people instead of one person and pad his criminal record. Not only that, we find that people get sentenced to outrageous sentences. And I don't know how many times I have heard a prosecutor or somebody else say, well, they simply do not send marijuana smokers to prison for 10 or 20 years. You cannot be sentenced like that for just simply smoking marijuana. And that's the truth, because nobody is ever convicted of smoking marijuana. No matter who you are and what your taste is in marijuana, you are going to be convicted as a drug dealer, as a distributor. For example, in 1992, Jimmy Montgomery of Oklahoma was sentenced to 10 years in prison for possession of two ounces of marijuana. Now, two ounces is about the same weight as the amount of tobacco that's in two packs of cigarettes. Montgomery was using the marijuana to relieve painful muscle spasms in his paralyzed limbs because he happened to be a paraplegic who's been in a wheelchair for over 20 years because of an industrial accident. But he was sentenced to 10 years in prison, not just as a possessor of marijuana, but somebody who was intending to distribute. And how did they know he was the, intending to distribute? Because of the testimony of the arresting officer who said he had never seen anyone with two ounces of marijuana who didn't intend to distribute. And that testimony was all it took to send Jimmy Montgomery to prison for 10 years. Now, these are not aberrations that have to be corrected through some kind of reform. These are inevitable. You cannot prosecute victimless crimes in the way that you can prosecute crimes against property, crimes against persons. It is simply not possible. A free society can keep violence to a minimum with a minimum amount of resources and a minimum amount of intrusions into the liberties of honest, innocent people. 
but you cannot prosecute victimless crimes in the same way, and so inevitably this leads to abuses. It leads to people being killed in mistaken drug raids. It leads to people serving enormous sentences for doing very little or being completely innocent. It leads to overcrowded prisons and overcrowded courts so that people who are truly violent and truly threats to society find themselves able to, get, to do plea bargains and other ways get away very simply. And let me give you a good example of that. Did you ever hear of Richard Allen Davis? He's a different kind of prisoner, a different kind of criminal. He's a violent man who has been in and out of prison all of his life. He had raped women, terrorized families, and robbed banks, and spent nearly half his life in prison. But no matter how badly he hurt people, he never served a complete sentence. He always managed to get parole or early release because the prisons are so crowded with nonviolent drug offenders. The life of Richard Allen Davis was one of, I guess you could call it a continuous horror story. On June 27, 1993, he was paroled from prison after serving only eight years of a 16-year sentence for assault with a deadly weapon. His frightening life reached its climax just three months after he was let out of prison early, when he kidnapped 12-year-old Polly Kloss in Petaluma, California, kidnapped her out of her bedroom and murdered her. The story made headlines all over the country. The Polly Kloss story. It led to new laws in California that even Polly Kloss's father thinks are vindictive. And that's what happens when somebody is truly a violent criminal. But don't worry. Law enforcement agencies are aggressively looking for pot smokers, minor drug dealers, and innocent people fingered by drug smugglers and throwing away the key and being tough on crime. Now, remember all this when they tell you that the Patriot Act isn't going to hurt anybody but terrorists. Of course, it's already been used to prosecute a strip club dealer in Las Vegas, California, Remember this when they tell you that the RICO laws are aimed only at big-time drug dealers. Of course, they've already been used to prosecute abortion clinic protesters. Remember this, that whatever the law is that they say that they are going to put on the books, it will quickly be expanded into something much worse, and it will uh, touch all kinds of people who were not the original intended uh, targets of the original law. And remember, more than anything else, that your innocence is no protection. Rather than continue the diatribe I was on, let's take some of the phone calls that are coming in. We'll start with Jacob in Syracuse, New York. Good evening, Jacob. Good evening, Harry. I just wanted to make a quick comment, if I could. Sure. I just wanted to, I remember when I was reading your book, The Great Libertarian Offer, and you, you devoted a chapter to the drug war, and mm-hmm. you talked about, about how politicians who talk about being tough on crime, like Duke Cunningham in California and Richard Shelby in Alabama, how when their children were caught with trafficking in drugs and possessing drugs, they didn't get rather strict sentences at all. In fact, I think Shelby's son only served one year as probation, and I don't really think that they see the effects of the drug laws because the drug laws don't apply equally to everyone. They're just completely wrong, but they have no idea because they use their political influence to keep their families out of the fray, and that's just my comment. Yeah, well, you're making a very, very important point. Because they know that they are immune from these things, they fear no consequences of these laws they pass. So they haven't read the law. So they don't know what's in it. So they don't know what terrible consequences may flow from it. So they don't know who might be hurt by it. They know that they personally will not be hurt by it. So why not vote for it if that's what the party wants them to do? Uh, Senator Shelby's son was found not on the basis of some drug dealer pointing the figure at him, but he was actually caught with 18 grams of hashish in his suitcase when he flew back into the country and landed at the Atlanta airport. And Senator Shelby's son, having been caught with the goods in hand, has never served a day in jail, let alone a day in prison. He was let off, I can't tell you the exact amount, but it was something like a $400 administrative fine that was imposed upon him at the airport. And then he was free to go from then on. Uh, Duke Cunningham, who you mentioned, the California legislator, um, his son was caught, and his son actually did go to prison, but he is serving a sentence about one-third to one-fourth of the sentence that would have been imposed upon somebody who was not a congressman's son. And in both those cases, Senator Shelby and Representative Cunningham, you had people who are virulent uh, anti-drug warriors. Uh, Senator Shelby, when he was appealed to by Lonnie Lundy's father, Lonnie Lundy was sent to prison for life with no hope of parole, again, only on the evidence of a drug dealer who recanted his testimony after the trial. And when Senator Shelby was appealed to to intervene in some way and help this poor young man who had been sent to prison, Senator Shelby said it's a terrible thing to have to go to prison for life, but the drug scourge in America is such that we need these uh, harsh sentences. It is the only possible way we are ever going to get out from under this terrible drug scourge that is afflicting America. And then within one year after that, his son was caught with the 18 grams of hashish, and suddenly it was a different story. But I can tell you this, if a new bill comes into Congress tomorrow to 
impose new harsh sentences on drug offenders, Senator Shelby will be there to vote for him. And it was the same thing with Representative Cunningham. He went into court and pleaded for leniency to for his son, saying, he's a good boy, he didn't mean to hurt anybody, and so on and so forth, as though you couldn't say this about anybody who was dragged into uh, court on any of these charges. And there are others. Senator Graham, who's no longer in uh, the Senate from Minnesota, had a son who was continually in trouble with uh, drugs and alcohol charges, and he, too, has never served a day in prison. So it's one law for the peons, that's you and me and everybody else in this country who pays our taxes and lives in fear of being suddenly swarmed into by a SWAT team that maybe is acting on a mistaken tip. And the others are the ones up there in Congress making these laws knowing they are immune. And one of the funniest things that has happened, if you can call it funny, was when the Republican Congress took over in 1995 and pledged that from now on Congress would be subject to all the same laws that it imposed upon the rest of the people. And, of course, that was one more thing in the contract with America that never came to pass. But anyway, Jacob, I appreciate you bringing this up because it's a very important part of all of this. If these people were subject to the same fears that we are, then these laws might not get passed. I have Anything? one question. Yeah, by all means, go ahead. I was wondering, I had heard from some people that the reason that medical marijuana legislation is not being passed is because all the contributions from the pharmaceutical industry to both parties who feel that they know that marijuana can combat nausea and other um, things, and that's why the Republican Democrats are not passing the legislation. Well, that's a good point. I have no personal knowledge of who is are the chief contributors to this campaign to keep the drug war active, but I do know that the union of prison guards and prosecutors are very, very strong on this and put a lot of money into the campaigns of the chief drug warriors. And Jacob brought up the important point that there are people who have a vested interest in making sure that drugs are not legalized. And for sure, we know all those people connected with the prisons, the suppliers, uh, the people who build the prisons and supply prisons with food and all the other necessities, prison guards, the unions of prison guards, the organizations of prosecuting attorneys, parole officers, all of these people have a vested interest, interest in keeping the drug war going. In addition, uh, Jacob mentioned the possibility of pharmaceutical companies uh, probably putting a lot of money into the campaigns of drug warriors because they don't want to see marijuana legalized. Whether or not that's true, I can't really say, but you can also probably figure that the people in the liquor industry and the tobacco industry are not very eager to see marijuana legalized, let alone all kinds of other mind-altering drugs. All right, since we are unable tonight to talk with Cisco from Frisco, we're going to talk instead with Justin from Tustin, Tustin, California, that is. Good evening, Justin. Good evening, Harry. How are you? Just fine. What's up? Uh, sorry to change topics on you real quick here. Oh, that's all right. Any topics, fair game here. Okay. The uh, Our involvement in Kosovo, it, at the time I was relatively young, more or less a teenager, and uh, I had no clue as to what was going on. My parents were talking about Clinton in the White House with various interns and so forth, so I didn't get uh, any in-depth um, analysis into what was going on. But since you're writing this book on the war racket, I wonder if you had any insight as to what our involvement was or what was accomplished by our involvement or anything like that. Well, obviously nothing was accomplished by it. The biggest, what should I say, sloganized version of why we had to be there was to stop the ethnic cleansing, uh, which meant that the Serbs were going into Kosovo and trying to get rid of all the Albanians. Kosovo was a province of the country of Serbia, uh, and still is the country of Serbia. And presumably the Serbians were going in there and deporting Albanians, who comprised a large part of the population of Kosovo, and they were killing a lot of them. There were supposedly mass graves. There are all kinds of the atrocities, very similar to what you heard about with Saddam Hussein and what you hear about anybody that the government wants to start a war with. Well, when the war was over and Slobodan Milosevic had not only been defeated, he was the premier of Serbia, but hauled off to the Netherlands to be tried as a war criminal, it turns out that the Albanians in Kosovo cleansed the whole province of any Serbs that were left. But NATO did not do anything about this. Nobody in the United States Congress was outraged. There was no aftermath or consequence of it whatsoever. And all the digging in the world didn't produce any mass graves. It was just one more excuse to go to war and to profit all the people who profit from war, which is not necessarily monetary profit through the sale of arms or missiles, but also just political profit. As your parents probably mentioned, they thought that perhaps part of the reason was to deflect interest from uh, Clinton's impeachment problems. Sure. And whether or not that is strictly true, we will never know without being able to open up President Clinton's mind and seeing what was inside. And I, for one, might find my stomach turned if we could ever do that. So I'm not too interested in doing it. All we know is that the United States had no business being there. The United States was not threatened. The only possible reason 
for the United States to go to war is to protect this country from an imminent invasion, and or I shouldn't even say imminent, from an actual invasion. If ships are off the coast getting ready to land Marines from some other country to invade New York or California or Louisiana, then obviously our country should repel these invaders. But to go halfway around the world and drop bombs on innocent people, whether in Iraq or in Kosovo or anywhere, Afghanistan, any place, the Sudan, wherever it may be, it makes no sense whatsoever and there is no moral justification for it. And if you say that our country is preemptively striking some other country because they may attack us, then what you have done is to open the door for every country in the world to attack any other country that it wants to on the premise that that other country might have attacked first if the first country didn't do so. And what you have is absolute chaos throughout the world. But, of course, the people who are promoting the war in Iraq and have been promoting it for the last two years don't care about that because we're right and they're wrong. And anything that our government wants to do is always right. If somebody else were to do it, like Hitler invading Czechoslovakia or the Soviets, invading Afghanistan, well, then they're wrong, of course, and they need to be repelled. I'm going on at great length there, Justin, but uh, anyway, I guess you got my point. Anything uh, further to follow up on that? Well, one thing I wanted to ask was there, there are several oversight committees for commerce and agriculture and everything else. Do you know if there's a, a war oversight committee that after the fact, all these entanglements we get into, if there's some committee that meets to... Well, there's a foreign affairs committee, but, you know, we really only have one party in Congress. Mm -hmm. And there are two factions in that party, and they scrape with each other, and they try to score political points off of each other. But there is a saying that I believe was first coined by Senator Vandenberg back in the late 1940s or the early 50s, that politics ends at the at the – what is it? Politics ends at the ocean's edge or something like that, meaning that we will never argue about what happens in foreign affairs, that we have a bipartisan foreign policy, which means Republicans and Democrats go along on it. And very rarely will the Republicans criticize Clinton for what he did in Kosovo. Very rarely would you find Democrats criticizing Bush for what he does in Iraq. And this goes all the way back to the previous presidents as well. Truman uh, had a free ride from the Republican Congress. Eisenhower had a free ride from the Democratic Congress. And it goes on and on and on right up until the present day. And as a result, uh, a president can act with a great sense of impunity, knowing that he is not going to be hauled before a congressional committee to explain all the mistakes that happened, to explain all the promises that were made that never came true, uh, that peace was going to come, that a country was going to be liberated and become a democratic country, uh, and to explain all of the lies that were told to haul us into that war, whatever it may have been. So it's really a terrible situation, and that's why we need a constitutional amendment that will make the president accountable. First of all, he can never declare war on his own, which is what, for the last 50 years, our presidents have been doing. Secondly, Congress would need a, something like a three-quarters vote, and only those people could vote who had a personal stake in it, meaning they were of draft age themselves, or they had children or grandchildren who were of draft age, and that the president himself must go before the Congress, and instead of saying he has evidence of an imminent threat, he must lay that evidence out and let the Congress people decide for themselves whether it's true. That is that didn't happen here. We heard over and over again from Colin Powell and from George Bush and Dick Cheney uh, that and Donald Rumsfeld that they had evidence of mobile laboratories. They had evidence of this. They had evidence of that. They showed us photographs, which didn't mean a thing because they were just photographs of uh, that could have been anything. And then nobody uh, said, well, let's see the actual evidence. And the country went to war on the basis of this evidence, and now none of it seems to be able to be backed up. Well, Harry, that sort of begs the question, do we need an amendment to enforce a constitutional provision that's already there? Well, I think I think we do. I think that the constitutional provision should be enforced, and I think that any congressman should be held accountable for not having abided by the constitutional provision that al already exists, meaning that any congressman who voted for the resolution to go to war on Iraq, which in effect gave the president a blank check, it was not a declaration of war. It said, you decide, Mr. President, which is not what the Constitution says. And so Congress was abdicating its responsibility and putting itself in a position where it didn't have to take the blame if something went wrong. So any congressman who voted for that should definitely be kicked out of office. But on top of that, just looking back over all the wars of the 20th century and seeing how we Congress voted us into war uh, with a declaration of war in World War I and World War II on spurious evidence and put us in the position of having millions of Americans killed on the basis of lies and false promises, we obviously need to beef this up and make it much more difficult for uh, our Congress, our president, or anybody in government to drag America into war. War is not just some John Wayne movie. War is people's lives being destroyed. People like you and me who have hopes and dreams, people who have children, people who have parents, people who have wives and husbands, people who have friends who love them, and going off to war and being killed so that some politician can have more power than he would have had otherwise, so some politician can reward his friends, so that some politician can go down in history as a great president because he led us during war instead of being just an average president. 
All of this has got to stop. War is the, the most vile, the most despicable kind of government program there is. Bad welfare programs hurt a number of people, and they waste tons of money. But wars kill people, and that's why they should never be tolerated unless our country's uh, security is at stake. And the only way you can make a clear-cut dividing line is to say that we should not fight unless this country is attacked directly, invaded directly. I don't know of any war that took place in the 20th century that was justified, not even World War II. On our behalf, anyway. Right. And and uh, it wasn't justified on behalf of the people in Eastern Europe who were supposed to be liberated and wound up in the throes of communism instead. It wasn't justified by the people in uh, many parts of Asia that were supposed to be liberated from the Japanese and instead wound up in North Korea and in North Vietnam and other places where they weren't free. All this talk about liberating countries is a lot of bull. Iraq hasn't been liberated. It's being occupied by a foreign power. People have to have identity cards and have to go through roadblocks and, and checkpoints. Uh, that's not a liberated country. That's just a lot of propaganda. That's just a lot of noise and a lot of, of high-sounding words. It was the same thing in World War II, but it was supposedly the one great just war. And, in fact, it was uh, waged on the basis of a lie that the Japanese had committed an unprovoked and surprise attack on Pearl Harbor. It was not a surprise, and it was not unprovoked. And all of that came out, but only after the war was over when people were no longer interested in it. We need to make this information available at a time when people can decide otherwise. Thanks so much for calling, Justin. Well, let's talk with Ray in California now and see what's on his mind. Good evening, Ray. What's up? Uh, not much. Uh, just a little curious about the Pearl Harbor days. Yes, sure. Yeah, yeah, we were saying we had, we had, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Fire warning, there we go, that's what I'm looking for. Yes. I got a guy sitting next to me held in here. <laughs> okay, so you, you've never heard much about this, I guess. No, I think my teacher, well, my teacher was a, my history teacher was heavy in the Air Force, so he probably glossed over this a little bit. Oh, would you have your, uh, turn your radio down, Ray? We're getting, uh, feedback from you. Yeah, have that. That's fine. Well, yeah. here's the, here's the story, Ray. In 1940 and 1941, President Franklin Roosevelt promised Winston Churchill that the United States would get into the war because they wanted to help out the English in fighting the Nazis, uh, Nazi Germany. And this was at a time when Americans were so disgusted with the outcome of World War I that there was overwhelming majorities in the polls opposed to the United States getting into the European war, which had already started. And... First of all, I should say that everything I'm telling you was revealed through either government documents or through the memoirs of people who were in Roosevelt's cabinet, people like Francis Perkins, the Secretary of Labor, Cordell Hull, the Secretary of State, Henry Stimson, the Secretary of War, and so on. These people all kept diaries. They all uh, published their memoirs eventually, and there was no secret about any of this. Roosevelt decided that the way to get into the European war was to bait the Japanese into going to war, and he did not as much as invite them to attack Pearl Harbor, but he initiated all kinds kinds of oppressions against the Japanese. He put sanctions on Japanese products. He kept steel from being exported to Japan. And Japan was merely trying to keep up in East Asia with the Dutch and the English and the, and, uh, the French, all of whom had extensive colonies in East Asia where they got raw materials from and other kinds of resources. And Japan is a country with almost no, no natural resources whatsoever. And so it needed to have the same kind of sources. It was willing to buy from those countries, but the French, the Dutch, and the British put the squeeze on them and would not sell to them in many cases. So the um, Japanese moved into Manchuria, which was a province of China. They also started moving down the coastline in East Asia and invading some of the countries there. And, of course, they were doing bad things in the process, but then so were the British and the French and the Germans and even the Chinese. Uh, not the Germans, I'm sorry, the Dutch. Anyway, Roosevelt kept putting the screws to the Japanese and finally uh, froze all of the Japanese assets in the United States, took their money away from them that was in American bank accounts, and kept uh, pushing them. And, as you know, George Bush has been saying that Saddam Hussein dragged his feet for 12 years. Well, Saddam Hussein wasn't dragging his feet. He was abiding by the U.N. sanctions, but every time he would abide by something, the United States, whether it was in the Clinton administration or the Bush administration, up the ante and said, no, we're not going to remove the sanctions on you. Well, the same thing was happening in 1940 and 41. The Japanese did everything they could to try to placate Roosevelt, but Roosevelt was not to be placated because he did want to provoke an incident. And finally... A couple of weeks before Pearl Harbor, the uh, Japanese moved into Thailand, and a year before, the British, the Dutch, and the Americans had already signed an agreement that if the Japanese moved into Thailand, all three countries would go to war with Japan. And Roosevelt announced to his cabinet that we were now at war, and it was now a case of getting the Japanese to fire the first shot. And so it was no surprise. Now, you add to all of this that they had already broken the Japanese diplomatic code two years before. They knew everything that was transpiring between Tokyo and the embassy in Washington and the, the negotiations that took place. And uh, and the story so far, when we left off, we were talking with Ray in California about Pearl Harbor. And I didn't make one point clear when I said that 
Bush talked about Saddam Hussein dragging his feet for 12 years when it was really the United States dragging its feet, saying that it would not remove the sanctions on Iraq no matter what Iraq did unless Saddam Hussein left the country. Well, it was pretty much the same thing in 1940 and 41. The way the story goes is that the Japanese were in Washington deceptively negotiating for peace when really they were trying to uh, getting ready to make war on the United States. But in fact, it was the United States that was deceptively negotiating because the Roosevelt administration had no intention whatsoever of reaching an agreement with the Japanese. They were hoping the Japanese would provoke something, create some kind of an incident that would draw the American people into war. Because, as I said, the American people were very much opposed to the idea of getting involved in the European war. But such was the dramatic sense of Pearl Harbor that Charles Lindbergh, who was the most widely known proponent of peace, of keeping America out of that war, the day after Pearl Harbor, Charles Lindbergh was at the recruiting office ready to join up and fight against the Japanese and the Germans. And as I said, the United States had broken the Japanese diplomatic code two years before, and they knew everything the Japanese were doing. According to John Stinnett's book, Day of Deceit, they had all, the United States had also broken the military code, and so even knew specifically that the Japanese were headed for Pearl Harbor. Before Stinnett revealed this from Freedom of Information Act request that revealed some of the documents of the time, before then it was known that the Americans knew that the Japanese were going to attack someplace on December 7th, but didn't know that it was specifically going to be Pearl Harbor. Any way you look at it, it was a deception by a United States president, because he had the power to do so, to drag Americans into war, to see hundreds of thousands of Americans killed, to further Roosevelt's promise to Churchill that the United States would get in the war and help the English against the Nazis. There is absolutely no possibility that the Japanese could have ever conquered America. When the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor, they knew they could not defeat America in a war, but because it was obvious that war was inevitable, they thought if they could destroy the American fleet, it might give them a year or two to try to figure out some way to defeat the United States. And, of course, the United States was never threatened by Nazi Germany. Hitler even liked the Americans. Hitler even liked the English. He didn't want to go to war with England, but England was drawn into the war because England had made a mutual defense treaty with Poland. And so when the Nazis attacked Poland, England was obligated to go to war, and that was something that Hitler regretted because he did not want to go to war even with the English. And, of course, even after the Battle of Britain, which the British won, Hitler was not able to cross the English Channel and invade England. So how in the world was he ever going to invade the United States? The United States was not threatened in any way. And by the time the war was over, all of the promises of world peace, all of the promises of the liberation of Europe, all of the many promises that had been made during the war of the better world that was going to exist when World War II was over, all those promises proved to be just as empty as the liberation of Iraq. Ray, have I answered your question? Yeah, I'm gonna, so I've got my best friend sitting next to me who really wants to ask you a question. Go ahead. Uh, my question is, uh, we had prior knowledge about Pearl Harbor, and it came out after September 11th that some of the FBI agents had made had serious inquiries about some of the terrorists that were involved in the attacks, and their memos were suppressed by their supervisors. Um, how, why do you feel that there was such an effort to suppress their efforts to investigate what they thought was a possible plot? I have no idea, and it would be pure speculation on my part. It has been said several times in the last two years that they received thousands of leads, thousands of bits of raw intelligence, and there was no way to know which ones to take seriously. Well, I'll tell you something. Any private company figures out a way to know what to take seriously and what not. And let me give you what seems like a far-fetched example, but it isn't. Have you ever heard of QVC, the shopping channel on television? Oh, yeah, uh, Okay, it's a it's a very large upscale uh, shopping uh, television channel, and they have to decide which products to air on television, and they have all kinds of products brought to them, not just hundreds, not just thousands, but tens of thousands of products every year are brought to them to be put on QVC and to be sold. And QVC, in its own self-interest and its own self-preservation, figures out a way to decide which ones to take seriously and which not, because its future depends upon it. But in government, nobody's future depends upon being right. It doesn't matter whether they figure out a system, and it doesn't matter if they slip up and 3,000 people get killed. Nobody gets fired for that. Nobody loses his job. Nobody gets docked from his paycheck. Nobody ever suffers from that, and so there is no need to make sure that you have a system to be able to tell the good leads from the bad leads. It, is, it just simply amazes me that nobody seems to notice that with $2 trillion at its disposal, $2 trillion a year of our money at its disposal, the government cannot figure out a way to protect us from terrorists. And the only answer it knows, when it's got this $2 trillion at its disposal to hire the best minds from all over the world to figure out how to handle things, the only method at its disposal is to use caveman tactics and go over and beat people with clubs uh, on the other side of the world. That's the only thing it knows to do. It doesn't make any 
sense whatsoever. But that doesn't answer your question, Mike. I really don't well, know like, what went on inside the government. It just seemed like September 11th was, you know, kind of like Pearl Harbor was our, you know, was our springboard to get into World War II. 9-11 was a springboard for the Patriot Act for us going over to Afghanistan. You know, it was all oh, sure. for getting us into Iraq this time. You know, it seems like, you know, that was just way too handy. You know, there, that if the evidence from those ladies would have been, you know, reviewed and let go through the channels instead of being suppressed, it probably would have been stopped. Well, that's very possible, and it may well be that two or three or five years from now, some Congress will get its gumption up and really investigate it and may reveal uh, exactly what happened and why people in our government didn't take seriously the threats against it and didn't do something about it in advance. Uh, all of that may come to light. The Pearl Harbor business didn't come to light until after World War II was over. And, of course, that's one of the great things for government is that by the time all this stuff comes to light, people don't care anymore. Even if your son was killed in World War II, it's all past history now. It isn't going to bring my son back, so I don't really care what the, was the proximate cause of World War II. It doesn't matter anymore. The wonderful thing about the Internet is that so much of this truth comes out contemporaneously instead of finding years later. And the result of that did not stop Bush from going into Iraq, but it may stop Bush from going into Syria or Lebanon or Iran or wherever they had in mind as being the next place to go. But still, it may be years before the real truth is found. In the meantime, we know that there were numerous lies, and whether they were lies on the part of George Bush or lies on the part of the people who advised him, but we know that they were making assertions for which there was no evidence. And lots of people are dead as a result of those assertions. And in any just situation, there would be people on trial right now trying to explain how they brought about the deaths of all those innocent people on the basis of no evidence whatsoever. That take care of it, Mike? Um, yeah, it was just the part that most bothered me about it is, you know, it just seems like 9-11 was such a handy springboard for so many things that have come about since, like you were talking about, you know. Sure, of course. Like going into Afghanistan, Iraq. Sure, you know, the, we, the got it, we got it, Mike, and someday we may find out the connection. Thank you very much, and thanks to Ray, and let's go now to Ed in New Orleans. Yeah, you were talking about how the, there's one set of laws for the ordinary people and another set, of course, for the upper crust, sure. including the government. Well, well, basically the government. Basically the government. It's amusing that this pretense by the United States Department of Transportation that they have any concern for the safety of the American public, because the American public, when it travels, whether within the city or without, the, the greatest danger they're from, the terrorist organization they have to fear the most, is the United States Department of Transportation. The United <laughs> States Department of Transportation is involved in funneling billions of American tax dollars into transit systems, that are run in such a criminally dangerous and negligent manner <laughs> that if that if they were private companies and they and they got sued, I mean they would they would be subject to billions of dollars in damages. Well, just the way federal roads are built, if a private company did that and you had that many deaths from automobile accidents, somebody would be hauled into court to to, to uh, be accountable for all those deaths. We see it all the time in similar situations. Hang on, Ed, we're going to okay. take a break. We'll be back in just a couple of minutes. What specifically were you concerned about? All right, I'll tell you an example. One, the Regional Transit Authority of New Orleans has been the benefit of a lot of their pork. Particularly, $150 million to, to record, restore the Canal Streetcar Line, which was ripped up back in 65. Back in May of 1991, I found out from a source I had in RTA, one of the old timers who, who was there when the company was privately run, that the controllers on the St. Charles Streetcars were being rebuilt in a defective and dangerous manner by politically connected contractors who didn't have any, obviously didn't have any idea what they were doing. Okay? On, by the way, I told the news media about this at the time, in May. On July 31st, 1991, one of these defective controllers caught fire in a crowded streetcar. By the way, even a defective controller would normally not have caused that much trouble, except mm -hmm. that RTA there would be was, some kind, huh? there'd be some kind of fail-safe mechanism in it to try to head it off. Of well, course, let's of course, cut, let's let's cut. Let me explain this. Of course, even back in the 20s when these cars were built, streetcars had circuit breakers. RTA, mm -hmm. I want you to listen carefully. The Regional Transit Authority of New Orleans was bypassing the circuit breakers. When, you, when this was told to U.S. DOT, they asked RTA to investigate themselves. Need, need I tell you what the results of that investigation were? Sure. <laughs> okay, let's, let's, uh, Ed, let's cut to the, to the end of this. How many people have lost their jobs in the government there or have been prosecuted for this? No, nobody. <laughs> well, of course. So your, your point is well taken. And we know that if this were Martha Stewart telling her stockholders that she had done no wrongdoing by her stock transactions in Imclone, she'd be hauled up before a federal prosecutor. We know that if this were uh, Dennis Kozlowski giving a party for his uh, wife's birthday with stockholder funds, that he would be up for 20 years in prison, according to Bill O'Reilly, who thinks that uh, Kozlowski's a crook, even though his stockholders weathered the bear market of 2000 to 2002 a lot better than their competitors did. And 
and we know that anybody in private enterprise who had done what you've just described would be facing a long prison term and would be getting the wrath of everybody in the news media around the country. But it is a double standard, and it will always be a double standard, and it is the answer is not reform. It is that none of these functions should ever be in the hands of political agencies. They should never be government projects because this is the inevitable result. Nobody is responsible, and nobody can be held accountable in government. It just simply cannot be fixed. It has to be taken out of the hands of government. Ed, thanks so much for calling. Let's go right back to New Orleans and talk with Jeffrey. And Jeffrey, first, my apology uh, on my sheet here where I'm keeping track of the calls. You're slipped through the crack, and you've been waiting much too long to get on the air. So let me apologize to begin with. But what's happening tonight, Jeffrey? I received a warning from a magazine called Cigar Aficionado, December 2003, reprinted on Newsmax.com, November 21st. The warning contained in an interview with General Tommy Franks is this. If a weapon of mass destruction is set off by, by anybody, either in Western Europe or the United States, the government is prepared to abrogate the Constitution permanently and establish a permanent martial law dictatorship. Franks, in the interview, outlined the steps the government would take, that is, abolishing the Constitution, establishing the dictatorship, and, and, the, and all the other consequences, including gun confiscation, etc., in this interview. Now, yes, that, that story has been circulating on the Internet, uh, and the interview obviously did take place, and Franks was serious. There are really two sides to this coin. One is that should there be an attack, maybe not even in the United States, but say in Iraq or someplace else with some so-called weapon of mass destruction, which could be almost anything, uh, that they might suspend all civil liberties in the United States. But there's another side to this coin, which I haven't seen anybody comment on, and that is that we should be so afraid that we could lose the Constitution, what's remaining of the Bill of Rights and our civil liberties, that we should agree with George Bush and others that we must preemptively attack somebody who might attack us with a weapon of mass destruction because once we allow that country to attack us, all of our freedoms are gone because the Constitution will be suspended. In other words, it's in the form of a threat. You better let the president do whatever he wants because if somebody should sneak through and attack us, then all of our freedoms are gone. Do you follow me? That's, that's exactly right. And that's why I've been warning everybody because I'm convinced that there are elements in the Bush administration that do want to bring about this destruction of the Constitution, etc. And as far as I'm concerned, this, this whole business is just another end in the, in the, in the game of, of imprisoning everybody. And I've been telling all the commentators down here they'd better start thinking about voting for libertarian or constitutionalist candidates if they, want to, if they want to prevent this thing from happening permanently. We're talking with Jeffrey in New Orleans. And, Jeffrey, if I were home, I'd put that article on the website. I won't be home until Friday, and I will try to remember to put it on the radio links page of my website, harrybrown.org. If you just go there and click on the... Saturday evening radio show section, which is right at the top of the home page, and then there you'll see links to articles and websites mentioned on the broadcast. And for anybody who has not seen that article, I'll try to get it up next Friday so that you can take a look at it. That's the article by General Tommy Franks warning that if anybody attacks the United States with a weapon of mass destruction, the Constitution is kaput. Anything further, Jeffrey? Yeah, three other things. First of all, in regard to this drug war business, the reason that the federal government uh, rewards tattletales is because they assume that the tattletales are the underlings of the, uh, of the quote, conspiracy, end of quote, to sell drugs, and that the people who don't turn in other people are the capos, the heads of the drug ring, if you will. Sure, and, exact, and exactly the opposite is true. That's right. It, it, is only the, it is only the heads who can turn in a whole bunch of people. The guy that's just going to get coffee for the bunch uh, doesn't know enough people to turn in to make it worth their while. So none of the big drug kingpins have ever gotten these long sentences, but there are underlings who have gotten sentences of 20, 30, 40 years because they've been turned in by the kingpins. Thank you very much for calling, Jeffrey. Good evening, George. Good evening, Harry. Um, I was going to bring up something to you and think about this. Did you ever notice how convenient it worked out during World War I Roosevelt was Secretary of the Navy, and uh, Churchill was First Lord of the Admiralty. In World War II, Roosevelt was President, and uh, Prime Minister was uh, Churchill. And, uh, you know, during World War I, that, uh, they wanted to get us in there. And to me, I feel the United States in World War I should have definitely been neutral or go on the German side if we had to get involved at all. Because I think things would have worked out far better if uh, the U.S. would never have gotten involved or been on the German side. Well, there's no question in my mind that if the United States had stayed out of World War I, there probably would never have been World War II, because there certainly would have never never been a Hitler, because the German people would have never accepted somebody like Adolf Hitler if it hadn't been for the horrendous reparations and the horrendous vindictiveness that the Allies imposed upon the Germans at the end of World War I, which would not have been possible if the United States had not come into the war and tipped it in favor of the Allies. They, both sides were already exploring peaceful ends to the war at, at the time when the United States finally declared war and entered it. And, and the United Oh, go ahead. I was going to say that whole Lusitania thing. You know, uh, how that, I mean, that's what gets me. That happens in 1915. An old, uh, what's his name, uh, Wilson gets reelected, only kept us out of war. And then in 1917, oh well, gee, guess what? We got to do something about the Lusitania, so we declared war. 
That was another convenient little uh, move. Well, yeah, actually, it was the unlimited warfare that the Germans declared in January. The Germans had been very, very careful trying not to attack American ships, but they finally decided that they had no choice but to try to end the war as quickly as possible by unlimited submarine warfare. But even that unlimited submarine warfare paled in comparison to the blockade that the British mm -hmm. Navy had put on Germany, which had starved to death about a half million Germans by that point. And the United States had declared itself to be neutral in 1914 when the war started, but Wilson made it very, very clear for three years that he was on the side of the Allies, and he overlooked all of the problems that the Allies, ca Allies, Allies caused, and at the same time was waxing indignant about any problem caused by the Germans. And uh, he finally decided to get into the war, according to all of the documents that are available, simply because he didn't think that he would get a place at the peace table to impose the kind of peace he wanted and to bring about his dream of a League of Nations, mm -hmm. unless the United States were an actual participant in the war, and that was the thing that decided it. And re with regard to the Lusitania, mm -hmm. the Lusitania was carrying munitions that is to correct. the British people, and Secretary of State William Jennings Bryan knew that, and he, when Wilson disregarded uh, Bryan's warnings about this, Bryan resigned as Secretary of State. He was so upset yeah. over what Wilson was doing. So uh, it's just one more thing, but in the, in the high school textbooks, it's that the Germans, uh, as much as attacked the United States, and so the United States had to go to war finally, and it brought peace to the world. Yeah, I remember that. And another one, too, during World War II about the, the German invasion of Britain. This is mm -hmm. something that totally shocked me, that I didn't know. Did you know that the Germans did not have any amphibious craft, any landing craft at all? They I believe I have them. heard that, yes. And, it, um, that was abs almost no chance that, that uh, right. Germany would ever cross the English Channel. Unless they either parachuted them in or landed them on aircraft. And, uh, well, just like another one, too, that surprised me, I did not know that the Germans didn't have any uh, aircraft carriers. No, they didn't. And going back to World War I again, uh, the, the German Navy was virtually destroyed at the beginning of the war and had no uh, parity whatsoever with the British except in the area of submarines, and that's why they were so relentless in the yeah. submarine warfare because it was the only weapon that they had, whereas the British had uh, battleships and cruisers and all of these other kinds of things and really dominated the, the seas. Yep. So uh, what, what, one thing we should make clear here is that in case anybody's getting the wrong impression by all of this, Hitler was one bad guy, but then so was Stalin and so was Roosevelt and so was Churchill. The Japanese were bad fellows. It was a military government that was in charge of Japan at the start of World War I and ruled Japan during the uh, entire World War, pardon me, World War II uh, throughout the entire war, and it was Hirohito, the emperor, that finally caused the Japanese to sue for peace. And... Uh, same thing is true in Iraq. Nobody is saying that Hussein was a good guy, but the fact that there are bad people in the world is not a reason to sacrifice American lives. It's bad enough that people are dying in other parts of the world. Why should we add Americans to that death toll when Americans are not threatened in any way by these countries, which is what happened in World War I, what happened in World War II, what happened in Korea, what happened in Vietnam, what happened in Afghanistan, and what happened twice in Iraq, and it happened in a lot of minor incidents that most people don't even know about, uh, and that is that uh, American forces creating a... a an overthrow of the government in Iran and these other parts of the world that most Americans don't know about, but that the people in those countries know about and remember full well, and that's why they are so bitter against the United States. Harry? Yes. One thing I, one thing I wanted to ask you had nothing to do is that you were talking about prisons. I don't know if you remember at Camp San Luis, the old hospital area there. You remember that? I was, in it, I was in it once, but I don't remember where it is. Okay, that's on top of the hill as you leave the town on the right side. Well, did you know that that was turned into a prison? No, I didn't. It's what kind of a prison? Men's colony. And over there where the stockade was on the left side of the roads where the sheriff has the jail. At the oh. Well, I was never in the stockade. I, I, I am <laughs> not a crook. <laughs> yeah, me neither. 20 years in the Army, and I never made it to the stockade, thank God. Well, they're running out of prisons, that's for sure, and they need to use just about anything they can. Thanks so much for calling, George. Keep Take me up to now. date on what's going on at Camp San Luis Obispo, where I went through basic training 50 years ago. Uh, let's go now to Rob. Rob, you with us? Yes, sir. Uh, what's can happening you hear me? in Pittsburgh? Yes, I can. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, I uh, actually I, I called to tell you something about some socialists I ran into, but uh, it, man, you've really got me thinking a lot about this World War. Uh, well, all these wars that you've been talking about—it's been a very interesting show tonight. I'm a little biased because um, my mom was almost killed by the Nazis, and some of her family, I think, died in places like Auschwitz. So I've well, always that's terrible. That's terrible, and it's something that never should have happened, and there never would have been a Hitler if the United States had minded its own business in World War One. I. I see what you're saying. I mean, you're making a lot of good points. I just I think it, I think it's a good thing that that uh, the United States helped to defeat Hitler, but the United States could have done other things better, like allowing refugees to come into, you know, I mean, I totally agree with everything you said before. If, if we just got rid of the welfare state, we wouldn't have anything to fear from immigrants. And uh, we wouldn't be, you know, in world, during World War II, uh, uh, a whole boatload of Jewish refugees was turned away. Yes, States, before, but, before World War II, the oh. Jewish refugees from Germany that tried to get into the United States, and Roosevelt turned them away. It's, it's one of the 
uh, phony arguments for World War II is the concentration camps. That, well, of course the United States had to go to war. Uh, of course the United States had to liberate those concentration camps. But the fact is the United States didn't liberate them. The United States finally won the war, and they went in and found that all these camps existed. But the United States did not prevent 6 million people from dying. If you could say 6 million people would have died if the United States had not entered, I might still oppose the war, but at least you would have a justifiable argument. But the fact is 6 million people did die. It's just like the drug war. Whenever anybody wants to justify the drug war, they bring up all of these horrendous stories about what have happened to people on drugs. But these are uh, stories that happened with drugs illegal. Tell me some stories, some horrendous things that happened when drugs were legal, and then we have something to talk about. Yeah. And in the same way, the United States did not save those Jews. The United States did not save the Poles or the Gypsies or the Slovaks or all the other people who were slaughtered by the Nazis. And well, the United States did not the... liberate the Eastern Europeans. They just turned them over from Hitler to Stalin. Well, yeah, I agree that, that that's bad. But I guess I'm just thinking that there were a few people still alive that were marked for death that, you know, the the defeat of Hitler did save some people. I mean, I think it saved my mom, but... Uh, and and, and I, I'm grateful for that, and I know that you are, but, of course, millions of other people died in the process. Yeah. Well, here's the thing. Before we run out of time, I wanted to tell you about something else. I, uh, you know, I've told you before about how I've been enjoying going to libertarian meetings in my area lately, and <clears throat> out of curiosity and attempt to be open-minded, or, well, maybe I was just looking for a debate. I don't know. I, I saw a poster. Have you ever heard of ISO? ISO. I don't think so. National Socialist Organization. No. Uh, they had a meeting. Well, they have, I guess they have weekly meetings at University of Pittsburgh, and I saw one that said capitalism and the environment. Well, I've always been very concerned about the environment, and actually I, I dragged my feet about becoming a libertarian because when I was younger I feared that smaller government wouldn't be able to stop pollution. And But I've read a lot of your articles since then, and you've given me a new perspective on why government is a big problem in the, in the pollution problem. You know, I don't know if it's all cleared up. I'm still trying to sort these things out and learn these things, but you know, I learned a lot from reading your articles, for example. But the um, I saw this poster at the University of Pittsburgh said capitalism and the environment, and that was going to be the topic of a... Uh, meeting of this international socialist organization, and um, I, I knew I, I went in there expecting to disagree with these people, but I had no idea what hardcore Marxists they were going to be. I walked in and they had a lot of literature with photographs of people like Lenin and Mao on the uh, covers of these newsletters and magazines, and I was pretty shocked. And off the top of my head, the only kind of meeting I can think of that would have been more offensive to me than theirs was probably like a Klan meeting or a Nazi meeting or something mm -hmm. like this. And they would probably be really shocked and outraged to hear me say that because they would say, well, we're not racist or sexist like those people are. But the thing is, they're very classist. And um, and they also believe that government can solve problems. No, so these people are more anarchical. They believe they don't really believe in government. They believe that the working they class... They believe that if the government gets big enough, then the government will wither away. And no, I don't know. I think they, they just... They're really radical. They want to see all the working people of the world just basically take over everything and run everything right. democratically... At, at the point of a gun, which is what, gover which is what government is. It's, it's always high-sounding that the people will take over, the people will rule, the workers will get their fair share and everything. Well, how are all these things going to be enforced? Well, they'll be enforced by a government. And they may not call it a government, they may not call it a state, but somebody's going to be there with guns to make sure that you do what they think is right. And this is, in just a grander way, the same thing that Republicans and Democrats are proposing when they talk about a prescription drug program or they talk about a new way to hold schools accountable. It's the same thing when they're talking about regulating businesses. It's it all comes back to the point of a gun, that somebody is going to enforce these rules, somebody is going to enforce these laws, somebody is going to make these things happen, and if you don't agree with it, then you can either uh, have your property confiscated or be carted off to prison. That is the nature of government, and that is why we cannot rely on it to bring peace to the world. We cannot rely on it to bring about a drug-free America. We cannot rely on it to solve the problems of illiteracy or the problems of, of seniors who don't have prescription drugs or any of these things. Whatever you turn over to the government is going to uh, be enforced at the point of a gun, and people are going to go without, people who cannot be seen, who will be invisible, and so their pain and their suffering that is caused by this will not be seen, while a few examples of benevolence will be held up as the great justification for all of these wonderful government programs. It has never worked. It is not going to work now. It will never work in the future. Thanks so much for calling, Rob. We're out of time. I want to thank very, very much Corrine Smith for taking care of things in Washington, D.C. I am particularly grateful.